going to your butt. Da -da -da. <laughs> Boop. Welcome to episode 70 of the Civil War Breakfast Club podcast, joined as always by Mary, a woman who would like to wish you a happy new beer. I am merely an empty discarded beer can left on the Times Square sidewalk named Darren. Happy new beer, Mary. <laughs> Happy New Beer to you, too. You are How not are you? just an empty, discarded can. Jeez. Uh, yeah, you're so why this a... podcast is as good as it oh, is. It's fabulous. It's fabulous. So how are you? How's, uh, how's your 2022? Oh, God. Well, <laughs> I'll put it at that. Well, no, no, actually, it's going okay, all things considered. It's going fine. You know, it's uh, we had our kind of first snowstorm here in southwestern Ontario the other day. So huh. going okay. great. Well, fun, fun, fun ride home. But... Yeah, no, fun. Like, we had a great podcast to kick off the new year. I thought episode 69, Sex and the Civil War, was a great way to kick off. 20, Everyone enjoyed it. Everyone did enjoy it. it certainly <laughs> Apparently. Did. It certainly Thanks did. to everybody who watched it on YouTube and uh, listened to it, you know, via Podbean or iTunes or however you listen to it. But anyway, how are you doing? Oh, I'm absolutely fabulous. Things are good. Things are fine. Moving right along here. Nice and cold. Winter has kicked in. We are beyond the holidays. We are now into the new year. We are full sailing ahead. There's a segue, by the way. That's what we're going to talk about tonight. Nice. Full sail mm. ahead to the new year. So what are we talking about today, Mayor? What, what, what's on the agenda for tonight? Well, we are going back into the Western Theater, and we are going to go back to the Vicksburg campaign, which we actually were there a year ago talking about Chickasaw Bayou or Chickasaw Bluffs. Oh. And we are going to go to this... It's kind of like the second part of that. You know, Sherman, he he loses the battle of Chickasaw Bayou against Stephen D. Lee. He loses it pretty fucking badly. And next up for him is Arkansas Post, which he does with uh, John McClernand. And part of the reason he goes after Arkansas Post is because of what happens at Chickasaw Bayou. So we are no looking question. at a... Looking at a part of the Vicksburg campaign that, as you and I were talking about, it doesn't really get discussed a lot. And it's also called the Battle of Fort Hindman. Hindman. Hind Hindman? So, oh, let's God. just jump the way back machine. The way back machine here real quick. I could turn just... back time. Okay, that's the children are scared. So, late 1862, Ulysses S. Grant says Vicksburg campaign is underway. Talk about that. One that would continue right up until July 4th of 1863. While the rebels are kind of hunkering down, uh, preparing to deal with that Union threat the city, there were also rebel troops in Arkansas yeah. at a place called Arkansas Post. So we'll talk about that in more detail. Now, the Confederates, you know, were there primarily because of its location. Now, mm -hmm. it's right along the bend of the Arkansas and the, and the White Rivers. And really, with, without that defense, the Union could theoretically attack Little Rock, Arkansas without much of an effort, kind of like you and a daily work day. You <laughs> kind of just mail that one in. But on, sept on September 28, 1862, Confederate Lieutenant General Theophilus Holmes, Mary, he's the commander of the Trans-Mississippi Department. Uh, he's also the North Carolinian, the son of the former governor, Gabriel Holmes, Mary. He's going to place Rebel Navy officer John Dunnington in charge of those river defenses of Arkansas. Now, Dunnington, you know, he is the, um, he's a captain of the Rebel gunboat called the Pontchartrain. What he's going to do is build a fort on the high ground of the Arkansas River, a place called Arkansas Post, right? Coincidentally, I don't know if you knew this, but Arkansas Post, did you know it was the site of the last skirmish of the American Revolution? Mm -hmm. right? There you go, right? Pretty cool. I do my but research. Anyhow, oh, I'm sure you did. Dunnington is going to build that fort called Fort Hindman, right? Now, this fort was a monster, and it looked like more of a, of a medieval fort or a castle than it did a 19th yeah. century uh, century one. Now, mm -hmm. Fort Hindman, it was sided with oak timbers and contained eight nine-inch Dahlgren rifles that Dunnington borrowed from his boat, the Pontchartrain, a 10-pound parrot gun, and six-pounder mm -hmm. smoothbores. So this thing was armed to the teeth uh, to defend the Arkansas River. As you said, it was Major Theophilus Holmes who's ordered the construction of it, and it's 25 miles above the mouth of the Arkansas River near Arkansas Post. And they can view it like where it's situated. It's kind of like a hairpin bend in the river so one mile that way one mile the other way they, they can view where stuff is it's the main fortification along the arkansas river and it's completed in late november and who it's named after heinzman is the commander of district of arkansas commander of the former commander of the department of trans mississippi it's a hundred it's square with exterior parapets 100 yards in length the ditch was 20 feet wide and eight feet deep and surrounded the fort there was a firing step for the infantry which ran the length of the interior walls and inside the fort there was a well two magazines and three buildings um, for the men to live outside of it there's a line of trenches which ran for about 720 yards 
before terminating at Post Bayou, and it's 25 feet high. There's additional rifle pits located to the northeast. At this time, also, there's a hospital opened in Arkansas Post, and winter quarters were constructed about several hundred yards north of the <laughs> fort. Wars seem to go on forever. Yes, right? yeah, and in December, um, the garrison at the fort was increased, presum- presumably because of the Union being in the area. So the number there was now three brigades of infantry, cavalry, dismounted cavalry, and some artillery support for a total of 5,000 men. And these troops are going to be from Arkansas, Texas, and Louisiana, and they're commanded by a guy named General Thomas James Churchill. And the one thing to note that going into the Battle of Arkansas Post is about 2,000 of these guys are going to be sick. There's been disease and, you know, sickness. Uh, Maybe it's COVID-63 that is running its way, whatever variant through that camp that's taken out 2,000 of these men. So I think they got 5,000 men. They've actually only got 3,000 that might be suitable for fighting. And the ones who are uh, feeling healthy, you know, they, a couple things. One, they don't they don't like Churchill. Why? Because yeah. most of these guys are Texans, and this guy is from Arkansas. You know, Churchill's in, Ar- in Arkansas, right? And they also hated the locations. You know what happened? When the river ran tall, the water came right up to the walls. And yeah. uh, one of the Rebs called it Fort Donaldson Number 2, right? Mm-hmm. So that was a big issue. Now, despite the fact that there's this garrison of 5,000 guys kind of around the corner, Grant and the Union really didn't seem to worry, think that much about Arkansas Post for the most part. They did make an um, attempt to take it in late November and early December, but it fails. And they just kind of were like, whatever, it doesn't matter. But that they just kind of, it was, it was there. It was just kind of, it's like Rhode Island. It's just there, but no one really cares. About it, you know? <laughs> it, but, but that's going to change in December 28th, 1862, when the Union steamer, the Blue Wing, gets fired upon by those Louisiana cavalry you mentioned. It gets captured, and they captured the steamer, and they took it to Arkansas Post. Yeah. Now, the, the Blue Wing was full of supplies, including coffee, whiskey, rindings, and a whole bunch of ammo. Right now, the capture of this boat and its supplies got the attention now of Grant's army faster than the attention you take on two and one happy hour. My God, <laughs> that's how quick how quick they wised up to that. Well, in particular, but, uh, it got the attention of Sherman because this boat, Blue Wing, was carrying munitions and coal that was hit it to him. And instead, the people like you know the troops at Fort Hindman, they're like, "All right." And this is really embarrassing for the Union that this has happened at this little kind of what they thought was like, ah, they're not a threat, right? Right? And then they fucking take the ship from them, right? Problem is that general, the guy who was really in charge, John McLaren, and we're going to talk a lot yeah. about, who, McLaren. according to William, Sh- William to Sherman, he had no real plans to do anything on this rebel fort, or nor the Blue Wing, for the most part. McLaren was, we're going to talk more detail about this specifically, but McLaren was extremely disliked by his peers. He was a difficult co-worker. He was that guy who said hot enough for you in the summertime on those hot days. That's who he was. So so Sherman <laughs> describes McLaren as the, he, the quote is, he's the meanest man we ever had in the West and with a mean, knowing ambition that would destroy anyone that would cross him. So real quick on John McLaren, okay? Born May 30th, 1812 in Kentucky, but he moves to Illinois. Mm-hmm. His father died soon after they moved there, so he had to get raised by his mother. So He was smart, and he was mostly self-educated to the point where he passed that Illinois bar and became a lawyer. Now, he was also a Democrat who despised abolitionists, but he was also very pro-union and very patriotic. Now, he's going to become a U.S. House of Representative from the state of Illinois in 1843, and was extremely popular. Now, with Mm -hmm. Clarendon, he was a political rival of Abraham Lincoln, okay, And uh, and he also supported Stephen Douglas, but the thing is, he was friendly with Lincoln, and and when the early in the early days of, of that, they they just somehow hit it off. So, which is why when the war broke out, Lincoln was quick to make him a general. Now, ironically, the other appointed general from Illinois was U.S. Grant. We're going to mm-hmm. talk about now. Grant he sees McLaren's popularity, and he wants to seize on it. And he asked him at one time to give a speech to his own twenty first Illinois troops in June of eighteen sixty one to discuss the importance of keeping the union together. But unfortunately, McLaren and Grant's relationship when Kim and Kanye soon afterwards never recovered. No, it 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 didn't. And it's the same with like, he's not well liked by Sherman, but he's kind of got this protection because he's friends with Abraham Lincoln. And the fact that Lincoln needs the support of the Democrats, he figures by bringing McLaren and in much the same way that Lincoln brings Franz Siegel in to get the support of the Germans, He's bringing McLernan in to get the support of the Democrats. And his military career is basically going to be this ongoing clash with Grant. And as we're going to see more so, this one is more so with Sherman. But McLernan is really shrewd. 
um he he takes you know kind of the worst parts of being a politician and he brings them into being a general um you know and he really thinks that because of lincoln he's got this protection that he's gonna be like he's kind of like oh i can do whatever i want and he does some pretty backhanded things um and as we're gonna see it it is gonna kind of backfire on him in the end it, it will. I mean, he's, you know, as soon as everything gets started, it goes back to the Battle of Belmont, right, in November yeah. of 1861. Now, real quick, I'm not going to talk about Battle of Belmont, but Grant's going to drive the Rebs along the Mississippi River, and, and he's on the verge of a gigantic Union victory. McLaren's men on this on this attack, they're going to stop to loot that vacated um, rebel camp, while McLaren is going to give a look at me victory speech about this battle. Now, Funny thing happens is while this is going on, guess what, what the Rebs do? They're going to counterattack and drive those federal troops back to, right all the way back to their transport ships. Now, after the battle, McLaren is actually going to lecture Grant on military yep. strategy. And Grant quickly pulls out his F this guy card. Mm -hmm. And that's pretty much the beginning of the end of it. But from this point on, McLaren is going to start writing to Lincoln, complaining about Grant for disrespecting him. Yep. Now, what McLaren wanted, I mean, of course, was his own army. Mm -hmm. So in February of 1862, he's going to go to Washington to see his old friend Lincoln without talking to Grant or even Halleck. And he's going to ask Lincoln to give him an army to command. Now, Lincoln and Stanton, are they're going to somewhat appease him. And they're going to give him those Illinois regiments that he recruited and tell them he can use them to attack Vicksburg. So what yeah. Lincoln's kind of doing here is kind of playing both sides of the fence with this. Yeah. Whether it be to get this guy the hell away from him or, or what. But it's, it's going to be a situation where Grant, of course, is going to find out about this because he always does. Yeah. And what does he do? He's going to ask Sherman to join him on the assaults of Vicksburg before McLaren gets back to Tennessee. So when he does get finally get back there, guess what's going to happen? All of McLaren's troops aren't going to be there anymore. No, they're going to be gone. And he's pissed. He's, he's pissed off. And eventually McLaren is, and his men are going to be added to that fourth corps, uh, primarily to that compromise that they had with that, um, they had with after Grant complained to Lincoln and Halleck. So basically, in a nutshell, everyone hated McLaren. When, when the Arkansas Post situation kind of came up, right? Yeah. Um, so, you know, Sherman, you know, he knew there was he knew there was no way they could really attack Vicksburg if Arkansas Post was there. So he visits McLaren, um, now commanding the Army of the, uh, of the, um, of the Mississippi. Yeah, um, which he names himself. He's technically only um, a corps commander, but he tells right. Sherman... Oh, actually, I'm in charge, and this is the Army of the Mississippi. Like he gives it his own name, um, which is completely against what he was not yeah. supposed to do. So, so they're going to meet on a headquarters ship, a ship called the Tigress, mm -hmm. and, and Sherman's going to bring along a, an actual soldier from that Blue Wing who escaped yeah. the Rebel capture. Right now, Sherman's going to ask permission. He's going to go to McLaren and say, "Hey, can I can I go down the Arkansas River and attack this Fort Hindman?" Then McLaren, of course, nopes him. No, no way. Yeah. Um, because he wants to have a meeting first with both Sherman and that Navy Admiral David Porter, right? Yeah. And um, so, jump ahead, January fourth, eighteen sixty-three, right around midnight. And this is this is this is a great story in itself. Here, they're all going to meet Porter on on Porter's ship called the Black Hawk. Yeah. And according to Sherman's memoirs, Porter was dishabbly. Yes, he was. Arrived, yeah. Okay which means he wasn't wearing much. Maybe he was reading Fanny Hill. But regardless, <laughs> when they got there, this David Porter is sitting in his all together, and here comes Sherman and McLaren. Now, by all accounts, this was a very, very tense meeting. Um, yeah. And Porter was extremely icy towards McLaren to the point where Sherman pulls him aside and says, what the hell's wrong with you? What's yeah, your he's problem? like, what's going on? And, and Porter basically tells him, like, I I don't like him, and part of that reason is because of how McLernan had treated Sherman in the past. That was factoring into his dislike of him. And he did like the fact that he was going around and once back to Lincoln, and that was the biggest. Part yeah, because he's question. a. I think it's because he's again he's McLernan is a political general, and if you're a political general, that is automatically a strike against you in especially in the eyes of these guys uh, that have been to West Point or are professionally trained, right? Yeah, I mean exactly, but but you know Sherman, you know he's still a little feeling it from that loss to John C. Pemberton at Chickasaw Bus. So he yeah. was he was going to do this, right? Yeah, and he clearly clearly wanted the opportunity to 
you know, I don't want to say redeem himself, but he wanted to fight again, right? Oh, that fact now, that is factoring into it big time because he thought that he's got this loss, but also the men have ju- yeah. his men have just found out about what's happened at Fredericksburg too, and it's like so they've got this loss at Chickasaw, yeah. but then they've also got the loss in mid December in the Eastern Theater at Fredericksburg, and Sherman's like, okay. How can I make this right and get myself a win? The, the opportunity was there. They needed to do something. Now, despite, you know, despite the fact that his boats were low on coal, that was the excuse that Porter gave him, he did agree to allow his fleet to, to go, mm-hmm. um, primarily because Sherman was involved. He trusts Sherman. Yeah. But he wants to personally go, too. Now, he, upon hearing that, McLaren goes, oh, good. Guess what? I'm going to go now. And so they must have just rolled their eyes yeah, and like, face oh, palm. Like, Is this freaking guy's going? So McLaren is going to do. He's going to divide this army into two corps. The yeah. 15th is going to be under Sherman. Uh, and then the 13th is going to be under named George Washington Morgan. Mm-hmm. Speaking of uh, Chickasaw, this is the guy that Sherman blamed for that whole disaster. Yeah. Right? Remember that. Mm-hmm. So in total, the feds are going to bring 30,000 infantry on, on the siege as well as 1,000 cavalry and 40 cannon. Now, Porter is going to send his fleet, including Ironclad's Louisville, Cincinnati, and the Baron de Cobb, as well as some rammers and 60 steamboats to carry the troops. Oh, and by the way, an additional 75 cannon. This is against 5,000 guys. Okay, yeah. this guy is this, so they're going, Sherman wanted, he he wanted to get his blingy on in this one. There oh, he's no big time it. getting his blingy on. He's like, well, I lost before, so I really got to bring it this time. And so Sherman Corps is going to be split into two divisions commanded by Frederick Steele and David Stewart. Frederick and Steele, I was thinking about that. He sounds like a guy who would have fit into our last episode. Okay. With probably, that name. I <laughs> <laughs> but but they're all going to get on those steamboats, and they're going to arrive just below Fort Hindman uh, on January 9th. The ships, are, of course, are spotted by the Rebel cavalry, and the fort goes went absolutely wild mm-hmm. with news of these oncoming Federals. You know, men quickly got in rifle pits. Um, the skirmish lines were set up. Everyone's yelling, it's happening, just like that meme. Yeah. It was all getting down. So once those guys disembarked, Stewart's 2nd Division – they're going to move up along that river uh, to a bank. And what's going to happen? They're going to bump into an initial rebel skirmish line. Now, Sherman was with Frederick Steele's 1st Division, and he's going to march on a road through a swamp to get in the rear of Fort Hindman. So that's they're originally they're going to try to attack in two different positions. They're going to savanna it? They're going to try to. So once they got near the fort, Sherman's going to hear that the Rebs abandoned that first skirmish line. So they had to go counter march all the way back to get back with Stewart's division so they can attack the fort all together now. So mm-hmm. he's like, okay. Now, by nightfall on January 9th, the Federals were, were so close to the rebel lines, um, in about four miles from the fort, but they're real close to that initial rebel line, that Sherman wrote that he could hear them preparing their breastworks for attack. He was that close. Yep. The next morning, January 10th at 4 o'clock in the morning, Sherman reports that he could hear the rebel bugler play rebelly. And Sherman said, it's the prettiest a revelry as I have ever listened to. Yeah. He's so you can romantic, just, isn't he? You can just picture him doing something like that. And there was other instances in the Civil War where Sherman did creep up really close so he could listen to them. Like, he he at times really put himself out there, probably kind of risky. But I thought that was really cool when I read that in his memoirs about oh. the, the revelry and how he thought it was really pretty and stuff. And it's like 4 a.m. and he's still up. He's not sleeping. You know, he's he's up scouting things. He's whatever he's doing. But when the sun did rise, uh, he could see those rebel entrenchments in that battle line in, in his front that connected Fort Hyman with that impossible swamp in its rear. So that rebels have a pretty good line. Not a lot of guys, but they got a good line. So Porter's boats are now filling the river. So they're in position to begin their bombardment. Now, mm-hmm. on the peninsula leading to the fort, there was a road. And Sherman's men are going to march on the right of the road. And Morgan's Corps is going to march on the left of the road. But where's McClernand at this whole time? He's back at his headquarters on the Tigris yep. on the boat. Reported that he kept a good eye on the situation because, and I quote, he placed a man in a tree. That's what he said, right? Brilliant. And so he knew what was going on. So we'll hear about that again later. So Did the man have the po- vision like a fucking hawk that he could must, see? Must have. Must have, you know. But the plan was for Porter's gunboats to unleash its guns on the fort on those rebel defenses while the infantry would assault the force from its rear, now where it was its most vulnerable. Now, when the boats started firing, Sherman and his guys were like five, six hundred yards away from the line. Yep. They were they were that close. So by mid-morning, by 11 o'clock or so, Porter begins firing his guns while Sherman and Morgan begin their ground assault. Now, mm-hmm. one rebel, he said, bullets and shells fell like hail. 
Uh, the Yankee infantry said it looked like fireworks on the 4th of July. So this picture, these guns, boom, 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 just going absolutely you know, haywire. John Harper, 113th Illinois, he said, the site was beautiful when they would fire. It looked like the, all the boats were on fire themselves. So you can just picture in your mind's eye how this thing must have looked. Yeah. Um, this onslaught was absolutely severe. It was brutal. Captain Samuel Foster of the 24th Texas, he said that, that their first shell passed just over the top of the fort. It struck the ground about 40 feet behind us and kept rolling along uh, breaking bushes. It scared us to death. The roar of the cannonade became so terrible, we had never heard anything like it. The shells were as big as wash pots. So not only are they getting hit by these a lot, they're firing some pretty big ordnance at these guys. Now, yeah. the, rebel, the rebel guns aren't going to be sitting back doing nothing. No. They're not Dairy Queen, they're not Dairy Queen employees. Hey, we work hard at the Dairy Queen of King Cardi. Of course you do, of course you do. But they're going to respond, and Porter's boats are going to take damage as well. That Louisville, they're going to lose 11 sailors. Yep. Um, the Baron de Cobb would lose 17. And a ship called the U.S. Rattler found itself getting stuck on the river 50 yards from yeah, the fort. Yeah, things don't turn out it, good for it. It just got astro-glided up and down until finally Ooh. it was able to break free. Yeah, And then finally <laughs> it, um, it limped its way back to the rest of the fleet. So tough day if you're on the Rattler. No <laughs> question about that. Um, but on the, on, you know, on the ground, the infantry on both sides were, were so close that they could fire volleys at each other almost right in their faces. Now, yep. Sherman, he's going to notice the Rebs were, were actually aiming at the officers, not the men. So he's going to say, dude, split up. Yep, tough day for mother. This. That's yep. the same situation, you know. Um, and that's going to continue on and on. But about 10 o'clock that night uh, on the 10th, Theophilus Holmes, now he's the commander of the Trans-Mississippi Department we mentioned, right? Yeah. He's going to send a message to Thomas Churchill, the general of the, um, in charge of the fort, to hold the garrison until help arrives or everyone is dead. Mm -hmm. That's the message he says. So shit. Lots right? of hope. Lots of hope. You know, it was. Um, by the next morning, though, uh, it was a beautiful Sunday morning by all accounts, Mary, mm -hmm. on the 11th. The Rebs had taken that overnight to, uh, to really reinforce and rebuild some of those damaged breastworks. Mm -hmm. um, they used a lot of dirt, a lot of logs from that previous day. Um, so what they also did, too, is they extended their line um, outside the fort to avoid being flanked by that Union infantry. Mm -hmm. So they're doing the best they can. You know, one Texan soldier, he writes, Churchill rode up to our lines in full uniform and said, boys, we will hold this fort or we will be shot down in these ditches. But then he also says, um, he says, in their front, it, it was as thick with blue coats as black birds on an oak stack in mid-morning, whatever the hell that means. Wow. But it sounds like there were a lot of blue blue jackets. I don't know about, the, I don't know about black yep. birds on Oats <laughs> Black birds. Jeez, that sounds okay. kind of poetic. You know, but um, but you know what happens again? The guns on the boat start again, and it starts yeah, and again. well, yeah, they're the gun. Like you know, you have the navy involved in this, which we haven't. Admittedly, we feel kind of bad for this. We haven't talked a lot about the navy, but they're heavily involved in this part of the Vicksburg campaign, and and they just keep pounding and pounding them, and. It's just that I think this is what wins Arkansas Post is is this oh, the, the Navy? Oh, there's no question. I mean, they're gonna start pounding again, and now now the shots are not only landing in the fort, but they're landing in those entrenchment lines now. Yeah. Robert Robert Chalk, you know who he is? He's from the Sixth Texas Mary. Yep. He writes, "One shell from the gunboats fell in our lines just under my feet. Little Frank McLaughlin was laying just in front of me. The shell cut him in two. Andy, Andy Sutter's legs uh, were cut off halfway between the knees and his hips. It was awful to see the great amount of blood gushing from his wounds. Oh. So this guy's right in the thick of it. And he, yeah, right, he's well, that's like what Ru that's a, like sounds a lot like what Rufus Dawes would have seen. Um, you know, and it takes only an hour to wreck one side of of Hindman and knock out all three, and then knock out th all three other heavy guns. Which, if they take out their artillery. You know, they don't have much left, right? I don't think little Frankie McLaughlin made it. I don't think so too. either. I don't think he did. Maybe they called him a little after he was cut in half. Maybe that's where he got the nickname from. I don't know. <laughs> no word if he was 5'4". 5'2 five, five, and a half. But, you know, but the, the, but the Union compounds it because what do they do is they start firing their, 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 their light artillery now in front yeah. of that rebel line as well as um, that they're going to have an enfilading fire from artillery that's going to be in a battery from across the river. Um, some of the Rebs said it was as loud as an earthquake. So you got the you have the artillery coming from the cannon, 
You've also got it from the boats, just pounding, pounding, pounding. Mm -hmm. This goes on for about 15 minutes, okay? Sherman, at this point, is going to order his 15 court uh, troops to move forward along that Union right. And as they're going, everyone's cheering. Yeah, you know, they're cheering as they're yep. moving. Um, they begin to start firing and start taking volleys. They actually initially get pushed back first. Mm -hmm. they, the, the packs, the, 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 the Rebs are so tightly packed in these, in these entrenchments that they're able to really yep. focus their fire. So Sherman has a tough time. The attack is going to sputter after the 83rd Ohio, of course, refused to advance. Of course. And, it, and, what, and what it did is it, it exposed that 77th Illinois so much the only thing they could do was literally to keep going was to walk over the fallen 83rd guys who wouldn't get up. And, and some of the Illinois soldiers said that they proudly trampled on some of the men of the cowardly 83rd Ohio who were cursed at them for stepping on them. One Illinois soldier said, we heard so many unpleasant anathemas from, those, from the Ohioans, which was ungenerally considering it was a Sunday. So can't swear on Sunday. I fucking do. <laughs> Well, of course you, you do, but um, but the reality is stubborn as the that rebel defense was. Yep. Numbers eventually do tell the story, um, and it turned the it really turned the tide in favor of the the rebs, um, and those blue coats continue to press that rebel line. Yep. Um, Churchill did get some reinforcements from the twenty fourth Arkansas, but it was like a hundred guys, so there wasn't. It's not much. enough. You know, and then soon after one of the bigger controversies in the battle. Or, or in the Trans Mississippi is going to take place. Yeah, and that is, uh, did Churchill order to surrender? Well, so around around this yeah. around this time, someone in the twenty fourth Texas under Colonel Robert Garland is going to raise a white flag yep. from behind the entrenchments, and all of a sudden, a bunch of little white rags are flying, waving around it. So if the Union men are going to quickly advance, and, and they're going to capture these surrendered uh, rebel troops. Now, Colonel Dayton. Uh, from Sherman's staff is going to ride to the rebel line. Eventually, Sherman himself is going to go up there yeah. and they're going to call a ceasefire, right? Sherman mentions in his memoirs that the carnage he saw once he got into the fort uh, was brutal. There was dead men and dead horses everywhere. Um, now, Sherman, he is going to meet uh, Colonel Garland, okay, the guy of the 24th Texas. Yeah. And um, he's going to tell him the usual stuff, stack your arms, wait for orders, um, you know, do your whole thing. He's then going to meet with General Churchill, uh, the commander of Fort Hyman. Now, when they meet, when they meet, Churchill says, "Well, Sherman, I've made the best fight. I made the best fight in my power." And Sherman responds, "In a very valiant fight, you made." I don't yeah. know if that was actually said, but that's what Sherman said. But they also got there. like there was a bit of fighting that went on too, right? Like Garland well, was like, "Why did you display the white white?" Like Churchill was like, "Why did you display the white flag oh. to Garland?" I received orders to do so from one of your staff and Churchill denied giving that order. And like Sherman just describes like this kind of angry words, which I, I can just imagine the language that was spoken that passed between them. So there was yeah. controversy but, behind but, that. It was before, before that happens though. Right. You know, church Churchill's going to realize that not all his men are very happy about the surrender or want to mm -hmm. John Dunnington, that Naval guy, um, you know, who he's the one who built the fort. He refused to surrender to anyone except his naval peer, David Porter. And when he did, he said to Porter, you wouldn't have gotten us up and off of your damn gunboats. That's what he says. But the biggest challenge they had was on was on that further on the rebel line yep. by a guy named James Deschler. Okay. James Deschler also refused to surrender. It was he 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 just he hadn't got you know he had got orders to surrender yet. Yep. So he's just gonna keep going. So Churchill and Sherman are actually going to ride down to see Deschler together. Now, you're Deschler, okay? You're a brigade commander. Here comes Churchill and William freaking Sherman riding. So, so oh, I can I, only imagine what he's I thinking, know, right? and, so, and Sherman's like, he's like, I spoke to him kindly saying that I knew a family of Deschlers in Columbus, Ohio, and were inquired if they were relations of his. So he's kind of like, hey, do I know you? And Deschler's going to respond back, no, I have no I have no relatives. Yeah. Thank you, sir, or something <laughs> like that. Um. But it was funny, that story you mentioned about Garland, you know, this is when he approaches him, when Churchill says to Garland, hey, why did you just play the freaking white flag? And he said, I, someone told me, you know, maybe it was Shaggy, he didn't do it, you know, but, some, <laughs> but someone got the, someone got the order, you know, um, and, but Churchill denied ever giving the order. Um, now, you know, with the fort under control now, because Deschler finally does surrender, with the fort under control, McLaren, who's still back on his boat, um, 
is going to order Sherman to leave AJ Smith in charge yeah. and return to the Tigress to talk with them. He wants to know what the story is. So, yeah. so McLaren, upon hearing the news that the army now controls uh, Fort Hyman, as well as a whole surrounding area, he yells, glorious, my star is on the ascendant. So he puts it all on him. Yeah. And he was jealous of the Navy. So we'll talk about this before. And he gave all credit to the army. He even told Washington, you know, glorious, glorious. I even had a man in a tree. He used that line to oh tell Washington God. about the man in the tree. Well, you can't even you imagine know? like Sherman shows up to the Tigress, right? And McClernand is sitting there doing his, oh, oh, my stars in the ascendant. And he's sitting on the boat deck, probably with a pineapple drink in his hand, right? You know, okay. I'm thinking of Ferris Bueller. That scene from Ferris Bueller. That's exactly how McLernan was being. It's just like that. Like, he, look at me. I got this he, victory, and I just put a guy in a tree. No, he, he stayed back, you know. So by nightfall on January 11th, you know, Sherman had again returned to the fort. He went back because he had to deal with the rebel prisoners, totaling about 4,800 men. Most of them are sick. An area, marched into an area just above the fort, right? Now, most of the Rebs, and this is, a, this is a good story, most of the Rebs are pissed off at Garland for waving that white flag because yeah. the story's making its way around the, the, the prisoners that he did this without orders, and they're all pissed at him, right? So for that reason, he's going to actually ask Sherman if he could stay with him that night and have a feeny pajama sleepover <laughs> with Sherman. <laughs> God. And Sherman agrees to it. He lets them. So according to Sherman... They had coffee and bread together and talked politics by the fire until the wee hours, until they turned in and went to bed. And what fee so pajamas him, did they have on? Were they superheroes? Probably, probably Scooby-Doo. Who the hell knows? But something was, <laughs> Sherman was something hot, you know? But, but, but he actually does that to protect the guy. So um, say well about Sherman, you know? <laughs> he protected the rebel guy. So the next day on the 12th, the Rebs are, are, are all put on the boats and they're going to be sent up to St. Louis and eventually to Northern Prisoner War Camps. Mm -hmm. Um there was a policy change at this point that there was no more prisoner exchanges, right? So they were all going to be shipped up to um, up to prisoner war camps. And you know what else they found? They found the blue wing. And they were so happy to see most of the supplies were still on it. So not only did they get the fort back, but they got their boat back. Um, A.J. Smith's going to leave on the 13th to take control of Fort Hyman. And, and the rest of McLaren's army is going to reembark on those steamers, and they're going to head back. And I guess it was a real bad snowstorm. We talked about the snow. Um, but I drove home in one was, of those today. Yeah, we heard all about it, you know. But it was probably it was right around now when, when, when McLaren is going to get a message from a pissed off U.S. Grant mm -hmm. who disapproved of the assault and called the attack on Arkansas Post, and I quote, a wild goose chase. So he had to he had to return to a place called Milliken's Bend to wait for Grant's arrival, and he knew yeah. he was pissed. It's kind of like when you drink all the whiskey at your house, and when you're younger, and your parents came home, and you knew they knew, and you you, you had to wait for it. Yeah. But while he's waiting, he's going to write out his official report of the Battle of Arkansas Post, and he's going to make zero mention of Porter or nor the Navy, not a word. Oh, and then this is McClernand, right? That that's how he. Right, so he's going to put every, he's going to take full credit for himself and his army yeah that's now, what sherman mentions he said um sherman said that this was unfair for i know that the admiral led his fleet in person in the river attack and that his gun silenced those of fort hindman and drove the gunners into the ditch and this is not you know this is just the beginning of sherman going on his campaign on this like against mcclernand which is rightful <laughs> right it was. Mm -hmm. McLaren's going to continue to trip all over himself. Yep. He's finally going to get fired at, you know, uh, at the Siege of Vicksburg later. We'll talk about that. You know, we've already talked about it. You can go back and mm -hmm. listen to that one again if you, Mary, if you forgot. But the thing about the victory of Arkansas Post, though, despite what Grant's opinion was, and admittedly, I think Grant wrote that quote about, about the goose chase before he knew they won. I think yeah. realistically he probably did. But yep. regardless – it had a lot of positives for the Union Army. Oh, it does. One, it, yeah. It, it, so, yeah it, sorry, go ahead. It freed up Union communication lines mm -hmm. on the Mississippi River for that Vicksburg campaign. And it really boosted the morale and helped the people forget, especially Sherman, about that Chickasaw Bayou. Yeah, thing. he was wanting to forget about Chickasaw Bayou. And you can see that in the letters that he writes post-Arkansas post Sorry, that was really awkward to say. Um, anyway, so he, like, after the battle, he is going to write three different letters. And Sherman is, like, he's talkative. 
in real life. And holy shit, this man is talkative in his letters too. Like I've got a book full of his Civil War letters. And um, it's interesting to read them because he's, he realizes and it's like, you know, I love Sherman. He He's a great general. Um, but my God, he can be bitchy, right? He definitely, um, like, he definitely has his moments. He, no he can get that. his, he can get his kind of like, he's, I mean, in this case, he's justified, but it's like to anybody who, who will listen, he, he wants to talk about what, what has happened and to kind of, he's trying to justify himself in, in, in what he's done. And so he writes to Ellen after the battle, we carried the post of Arkansas yesterday and captured all of its stores and garrison. As usual, my troops had the fighting and did the work, but of course, others will claim the merit of glory. Let them have it. The soldiers know who studied the ground ahead and directed the movement. It was not a battle, but a clean little affair. Success perfect. Our loss comparatively light. So there he's kind of throwing a little bit of shade at McClernand without saying his name. But to his father-in-law, Thomas Ewing, who obviously has political connections in uh, Washington, he writes, It was a worry to me to place McClernand in command, but I must not question Mr. Lincoln's right to select his own leaders. To me, McClernand is one of the most objectionable because his master is Illinois and his personal notoriety, whereas I prefer to serve the whole United States and to check the gnawing and craving appetite for personal fame and notoriety. And he also goes on to write Thomas Ewing, of course the world will hold me responsible for the failure at Vicksburg, meaning Chickasaw Bayou, and give McClernand the complete success at the post and being interested, I must not question the verdict. Um, And finally to his brother... Uh, he writes, of course, I must be satisfied with being beaten at Vicksburg and leave McClernand to get the credit of this success, though I doubt if there be many in the army who believe he conceived the idea or executed it. I led the columns, gave all the orders and entered the place where he came along and managed the prisoners and captured property. So he is really bitter about this. And that's the interesting thing about studying Arkansas Post is not just the battle itself and what it means for communications for the Union going into the Vicksburg campaign and how they're not going to wor- have to worry about their boats getting intercepted because they don't have convoys going with them down the Arkansas River. It is this kind of mean girls thing that's going on between Sherman and McClernand. Well, doesn't Sherman do the same thing, though, with Porter? I mean, they go to, he wins Absolutely. Arkansas Post, a great picture. Yeah. He doesn't really, I mean... He, he's he, not giving he, any you know, credit to Porter. And he also got an easy win because the other guy threw in the towel without orders, right? Exactly. Now, they were gonna, they were, they were gonna win anyway. But I, I just got a kick out of that. Um, yeah, he's not mentioning and embellishing. Yeah, you know. And he's but, not mentioning. But, oh, by the way, Porter was there too, and he fucking helped me because without him, we would. Because no. you, you got to admit, without Porter, they could not have taken Arkansas Post. I think they could have. I mean, well, assuming they could have got there. They had to get there. Exactly. So they, they needed the bull they, they They needed so, the Navy. You know, so I guess, yes. But as far as when the battle started, I think the infantry with the artillery probably could have taken it, but they had to get there. So, yeah, they had to get there. So, yeah, yeah absolutely. But I think the bombardment um, from Porter's boats really is, I don't know, it's a very, the Navy's very underrated in the Civil War to begin with. And I think this is one of the places where they really help out quite a bit and they don't get the credit. I mean, Arkansas Post doesn't get talked about enough in the Vicksburg campaign. And I think nah, it's a really nobody, important part of the Vicksburg campaign. Nah, nobody talks about that, especially for the morale. We talk about the morale on the north, but the morale on the south was pretty was pretty low, especially in Arkansas in yeah. this battle. After Hyman fell, many of the c- civilian slave owners took their slaves and moved to Texas because mm-hmm. they figured they had an easy walk. They were going to come and take their slaves. But when you look at the total casualty reports, you know, the, you know, um, you know, so, so for the Union, they lost they lost 100, only 134 guys, but they had 898 wounded and about 30 missing. Mm-hmm. The Rebs only lost 60 guys who were actually killed. Yeah, they had 80 wounded, but 4,791 captured. So they bagged the whole garrison. As a matter of fact, the Confederate losses represented 25% of the total rebels in the Trans-Mississippi region. So anybody who says Arkansas Post is kind of meaningless is insane because you could have guaranteed, you know, that that the Confederates, Pemberton, could have used 5,000 guys at the siege of Vicksburg at exactly. some point to try to reach or leave that yeah, siege. Yeah, because you so, think if they didn't bother to go after Arkansas Post, there would have been a point where Pemberton was like, okay, you guys, like, uh, like just abandon it or leave skeleton crew get up here we need your help 
you know, he could have very well done that. But it's also strategic. Strategic, too, is, you know, if you're taking a boat from Memphis, right, yeah. that whole area down to Vicksburg, down that area, you got to go right down past the Arkansas River. Mm -hmm. And I know that Arkansas Post is not on the Mississippi but it's close enough where it's you got to look over your shoulder as you're going by. Yeah, well, it's the, the one union were still to wanting to about. the the union were still wanting to send boats up and down the Arkansas River, and that's what they were uh -huh. doing with Blue Wing, and Blue Wing got taken because they weren't sending the convoys right. with it to protect it, and they needed to have that. And as well as you said, you know, it's going to secure like communications as well. Yeah, and it was really a very underrated slam dunk victory. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it's one that Sherman needed for his own psychological being, but I also think that the union needed it. Um, it did give McLaren star a little bright, little shine for a little while. Uh, Cause you know the, how badly he wanted to report his victories, yeah. um, his star and the ascendance and all that stuff. But I think what it did do, it did further the divide between him and Grant and Porter and Sherman. And with a guy like McLaren and, they knew the emperor has no clothes. They all knew it. Oh yeah. And it, it, it took them a while. It really wasn't until the siege in, 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 in you know, in June and July, yeah. um, when he claimed that great victory in the parapets and they lied and sure. You know, then they finally got rid of him and, you know, then they were all joking that he quit and got him the hell out of Dodge. So he was a guy, he's that guy in the office who no one likes and they just, and he just, and he's taking credit. credit for everything. Like he's sitting up on the Tigris with his like pineapple drink on his beach chair. And he's like, Ooh, look at me. My stars in the ascendancy right now. Like, and, and Sherman's like, I just did all the fucking work. Like what the hell dude. But then again, you know, you have Sherman writing to his wife and his father-in-law and his brother, and he's not talking. About I mean, he might mention Porter a little bit, but he's like, geez, I guess I'm going to have to take this fucking loss at Chickasaw. The Chickasaw thing definitely drew blood. There's no question. He oh, did. he think... was so just that really took it. I think he, you know, Chickasaw, like going into the Vicksburg campaign, I think he and Grant thought they had it. And then the shit at Holly Springs went down with Earl Van Doren and Grant couldn't get to Chickasaw and... Sherman didn't have the right maps. And I think it was just Sherman getting a little bit ballsy ends up being taken down a few pegs because he loses, right? Oh, they would like nothing more if they could have taken Vicksburg before McLaren got oh, back to Tennessee. They thought for sure it was going to happen. And then Earl Van Dorn comes in and he screws all that up. He does. And then Stephen D. Lee gets on that, that, that ridge. Yeah. And the hell out of Don at Chickasaw. So. Yeah. If any, anyway, if, if y'all want to know what we're talking about, listen to our episode about Chickasaw Bayou. Uh, which we recorded last year around this time. Around this time. So what it does, it, re it really freed up Grant uh, to continue his, that long siege is going to take place till next July. Um, but it just, like, it takes 5,000 guys out of the equation. It gives the union a much needed win after yeah. the Chickasaw Bayou and the whole fiasco. And including the, the loss at Fredericksburg too. Like it gives them that kind of, cause they knew about that. And that was Sherman said that was affecting the troops is hearing about that loss at Fredericksburg. No, no question, no question. So that's a pretty good discussion we could talk about right there. So what, what's coming down the pike for us? Well, what's new? the one thing that we have to mention that we didn't at the beginning was what are we drinking tonight? What did we drink during this yeah, episode? Yeah, I, I, I know, I noticed, I noticed you forgot about that. Uh, I, um, what? So okay, since you asked, who was hosting tonight? Ladies first. I was going to wait for you to announce who you were drinking. Oh, you know? my God. Um, anyway, I am drinking Monogamy by Bellwoods Brewery out of Toronto. It is a single, it's a single hop IPA. It's awesome. They do a different one every so often with a different type of hop in it. And I am drinking it out of one of my Sherman mugs, which is I Dream of a Brighter Atlanta. I know tonight's episode had nothing to do with Atlanta, but it was the only Sherman mug I could find in my sure. cupboard. So okay. what are you drinking? Well, I'm drinking from Trillium, a beer called True New Englander, which is what I am because I'm cold and miserable and arrogant. Mm. But that's what I'm drinking right <laughs> here. And, I, and I'm drinking it out of my U.S. Grant coffee mug. Is that the one you bought in, you, in uh, Gettysburg last month? Matter of fact, it is, Mary. Matter of awesome. fact, it is. Awesome. And as he always says, I've never advocated war except at a means of peace. I so bought anyway, the Arkansas same Post, mug. You did, of course you did. Copycat. But anyway, um, but I thought I think it's a fun discussion to talk about this. I think... As far as a battle goes, I mean, there were casualties. It wasn't that much. But I think it's interesting to have that joint Army-Navy attack that was very yeah. well coordinated. Um, and you don't see it too, too much in the war. You do from time to time, but not like this. Well, you don't um, hear about the Navy very much. They're like the red-headed stepchild that doesn't get talked about. And in this one, they are definitely a part of it. And, I mean, my opinion is they are the 
the reason that they won this. They needed the Navy in this battle to win it. They did, and they had to win. When you're taking 30,000 infantry, a bunch of ironclads, mm. you're taking rammers, you get artillery, cavalry, going against a 5,000-man garrison. You knew they were going there to, yeah. to, to beat them up a little bit, and I think they had to, and they did. And um, and I think it's uh, it certainly helped keep the momentum going and get that maybe that spark back to head into Vicksburg in, um, as they head into that 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 winter into spring campaign that led into summer, which finally led to the fall of Vicksburg. Nine July months 4th. later. Nine months later, but again, <laughs> that, that was really that was really a gigantic change um, in, in in you know for for Lincoln after those things you talked about before with Fredericksburg and some of the crappy yeah. luck that he had. And it really it, Vicksburg really changed the war. Meanwhile, Gettysburg's taking place down the the other side of the uh, of the coast as yep. well so what is coming up next mary since you didn't answer me um, well we are going to be talking fort fisher and then oh. we are going to be talking mill springs Ooh, little george thomas Ooh, the rock oh no oh, and then no. i think it's on january the 19th we are going to be having our first round table of 2022 so if you want to sign up for that info at civilwarbreakfastclub.com and then on January the 26th at 6 p.m., we are going to be having our first book club meeting of 2022. And our first book for 2022 is Armistead and Hancock by Tom McMillan. He will be joining us for that discussion on January the 26th at 6 p.m. via Zoom. Anyone is welcome, even if you haven't read the book. You are welcome to join us. Just come sit in, listen to the discussion. And if it intrigues you enough, hopefully you will buy the book and read it. Info at CivilWarBreakfastClub.com. And we will send you an invite. All right. Sounds like a good time. So off we go. Any final words from you, Fincheroo? Well, thank you as always for bringing it like you always do into our second episode of 2022. You are an amazing co-host. And thank you to our listeners uh, for supporting us for these 70 episodes. 70 in the books. We are on to 2022. We are good to go. <laughs> and we are ready to go on a fun and exciting year with a bunch of fun stuff we are going to talk about. So that is it. So thanks for signing on, everybody. Thanks for listening to us. We appreciate it. Hope to see you at our live this weekend. We have a good, long, and safe weekend. If the weather sucks where you are, where it probably is, stay safe, stay warm. And we will look forward to talking to you all on the other side. See y'all later. Peace out. Bye.